I often ask people how or where they experience God. And it's amazing at some of the answers. Um, some people say, in my family. Some people say, in worship, I hope. Uh, through their friends, through sacred writings. But the most common response is that people experience God in nature. Now I see some heads and so on. Yeah, um, that's where I think I experience God the most is out in creation. There's something about creation, something neat. Um, maybe it's the flowers that hold our attention. Maybe it's the small birds that we see. Um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's the trees. I'm always attracted to the trees. They're so strong. And, you know, their, their roots are in the ground and their limbs are reaching to heaven. And the mountains, the mountains just kind of force our insignificance upon us. Yeah. And the new dawn fills us with awe. Creation speaks to us of the divine. And as our psalm from this morning's reading tells us, creation does it all without words. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Creation speaks to us of God just by being. It doesn't need words. And when we are silent in creation, we begin to listen and hopefully to finally hear. The silence can fill us with something that we seldom experience. But because we're human, this experience doesn't last very long because we humans live and breathe words. We're talking all the time, most of us, except us introverts, and we're pretty quiet, but we humans seem to need words. We seem to be, we seem to have to define everything and explain everything. And usually when we're in nature or see something that, see something somewhere, our first response is to describe it. That's lovely. That's beautiful. That's ugly. That doesn't make sense. We attempt to pull the experience of silence into our neat little boxes of understanding rather than just experiencing the moment. For an example, Wednesday morning I was driving by a swampy area and as I glanced over this heron, wings spread out, legs back, coming in for a perfect three-point landing. It was gorgeous. And even though it was just me, I had to resort to words. I said, oh boy, that's really beautiful, that's awesome. Instead of just being with that heron and watching it fly. You know, I resorted back to words. And when I did that, I stop the experience of being. I think the psalmist does something similar. The psalmist is using words, of course, speaking about how silent and yet how shouting creation is. And then the psalmist uses words to describe God's law. It appears to me when I was reading the psalm that this should be the beginning of an entirely different psalm because it seems so different, so out of place. But it's right there after the silence. I don't know, but maybe this is because over the centuries, as we have stopped sitting with the shouting silence of creation, we have also stopped sitting with the shouting silence of God's law. We've been taught to believe that the law is the Ten Commandments. 
But look what has happened through all the years. We have the books now, Leviticus and Deuteronomy and other writings, all those words upon words to help us try and understand the law. Jesus, a man of few words and lots of action, made it pretty simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Less words, pretty simple. But our psalmist continues to use words to tell us about that loving law. He says that law is perfect, perfect and sure and clear. The law is pure and true and desired beyond all wealth. That law revives us, makes us wise, and enlightens us. They're all good words. I wonder then why we have such trouble keeping that law. And maybe it is because of all those words. Even words that the psalmist used. Those words that put the law into the box determined by each person's use of the words in their writings. We put things in boxes all the time because we try and understand them and we use our words to try and understand them and then try to explain it to other people who have their own boxes full of their own words. I wonder what might happen if we just sat in silence with God's creation and the law of love and express that love in the silence of our actions. I think many of us would have a difficult time with that. Why? James tells us why. We can control a great many things, horses and large vessels, but we cannot control our tongues. Those things that pronounce the words. Those words that come from our thoughts and hearts and spirits. What's supposed to guide those thoughts and hearts and spirits? It's God's law of love. We hear that in 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Love is the top and bottom and middle of everything that exists. Creation shouts it in sunrise and sunset, in blooming flower and metallic beetle, in new life and even in death. And in spite of all the words, the Hebrew Bible and our New Testament shout God's love as well. We are loved and we are to share that love in and beyond our words. What keeps us from following that law of love? It's the thoughts and desires that arise from our egos and our false selves. It is wanting our own way rather than spending silent time listening to what God wants. Think for a moment about all the hurt that's been caused because we want our own way in a meeting. Think about the hurt our gossip has caused. Think about what we have done in the name of God, but it was really for our own uplifting and our personal gathering of our fuzzies. The law of love is not an easy law to follow. To follow this way of living means we need to look deeply into our egos and ask God to reveal the hidden agendas or passions as the early desert fathers and mothers called them. Sometimes it means bridling our tongues and putting a stop to our false self thinking and talking. It's difficult work. And we will not be able to do that work if we remain caught up in our words. This work is best done in silence.
Thomas Merton in his book, New Seeds of Contemplation, writes, To say that I am made in the image of God is to say that love is the reason for my existence, for God is love. Love is my true identity. Selflessness is my true self. Love is my true character. Love is my name. If, therefore, I do anything or think anything or say anything or know anything that is not purely for the love of God, it cannot give me peace or rest or fulfillment or joy. We need to remember Merton's words as we enter our meetings with our personal agendas. We need to remember them as we sit and visit at our dinners and social gatherings. We need to remember them when hateful and hurtful thoughts enter our spirit. And we need to remember them when life does not go the way we think it should. The accident that slows us down, the long line in the grocery store, the boring sermon, the hymns we don't like. I'm certain you can think of other ways and times. Those are just a few of my own passions. <laughs> you know, I need to sit quietly with God and ask God to bring more of those forth so that they can be healed and dealt with. James tells us that no one can tame the tongue. We bless and curse with it. I disagree with James on that because I think we can learn with God's help to tame the tongue and our thoughts. It takes a lot of deep searching into our inner beings and what makes us tick. It is looking at all the hurts, usually made by words. Yeah, you know that little saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but hurt, words will never hurt me? Words hurt worse. Words go deep inside of us and hurt us. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but Pima Chodron, I believe is her name. She's a Buddhist nun. She writes, The most fundamental aggression to ourselves and the most fundamental harm we can do to ourselves is to remain ignorant by not having the courage and the respect to look at ourselves honestly and gently. We can ask God to reveal us to ourselves and be open to what is revealed. We can learn to move out of our egos into the true being of love intended in the creation of the world and our creation. We can learn to manage our thoughts and tame our tongues and be comfortable with the silence of creation and love. When people look at us, our lives will shout in silence. God's love. The psalmist continues to write. I'm going to paraphrase this a bit and add a few words. Expose me. Clear me from hidden thoughts. Keep back your servant also from ego thinking. Do not let this thinking have dominion over me. Let me sit in silence and think on my heart and words. Only then, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May this be our prayer as we sit for a moment with God in silence.